what other things uh, help us in terms of the surgery that we do? <coughs> One of the major advances in terms of uh, neurosurgery over the last decade and a half has been neuronavigation. And just as navigation aids help us to know where we are, where we're going, and how to get there, in the operating room, we use those same technologies. And many of you <coughs> uh, who have had surgery recently will know that before surgery, you have an MRI uh, and uh, now a CT scan. And those images are taken and they are uh, put into a, a computer in the operating room that reconstructs the brain in a three-dimensional space on the computer. And in that way, uh, we know exactly where we are at any given point in the surgery. And again, where being off by a few millimeters one way or the other could have uh, major consequences, having this uh, kind of technology to support you as a surgeon uh, has been a tremendous uh, boom in terms of uh, what we're able to uh, uh, have as surgical aids and what we're able to do then uh, in terms of our surgical procedure. One of the other uh, things that has been important is knowing where the arteries are at any given time. And one of the things that <coughs> we actually did, could I have the lights on here, off here please? That we did uh, uh, here in Halifax is uh, develop a protocol that, uh, again, this is a protocol that you, or that uh, anyone who's been operated in the last five to seven years would have had uh, this done. A protocol whereby, uh, the arteries in particular are given a, a different color through a special MRI sequence that we've developed. And uh, we published this a few years ago and this provides, in, at the time of surgery, we know exactly where those carotid arteries are. And again, this is, uh, this is an important uh, uh, development in terms of trying to do the surgery as safely uh, as we can. What else has... Uh, has uh, come. Uh, there was a lot of optimism that uh, intraoperative MRI may be quite helpful for uh, uh, operating on patients with pituitary tumors. We have uh, done a few uh, surgeries using the intraoperative MRI and this is the one that we have uh, in our facility. However, uh, it has really been superseded by uh, another technology. And that technology is the development of the endoscope. And I have an endoscope here. <coughs> and this uh, is an endoscope. And what this does, it is really transformative in terms of the surgery. So imagine if you're trying to work at the end of this tube and you're trying to see where the palm of my hand is, for example. And if that's your only corridor, then the light has to come through there, and the light, really, you're limited by what you can see by that uh, column of light. Now, instead, if you were to take this and put this in, what you can see is actually from the tip of this uh, scope. So there's a camera, essentially, right at the end of this. And from this, we can not only see straight ahead, but in, for example, in this, uh, in this particular one that I brought here, this is at 30 degrees. So that means that it can see, uh, it actually has a 40, it goes about 45 either way and then rotate another 30. So you can see almost straight up. So you could turn around either side. And these come in various uh, angles. So you can get them, for example, there's a 70 degree one, which means you can literally see around the corner. And so, uh, again, this has been a tremendous uh, help in terms of, of uh, seeing what we're trying to remove and, uh, and also to, uh, to see and understand the anatomy that we're trying not to disturb. And just as a, just so you have an understanding of how that, uh, that works, um, there's essentially the scope like this and there's a, a port on the side here which provides the light. And so that hooks up like that. This uh, hooks into a camera and then it means that we can see 
on screens in front of us what the camera is seeing here. And <coughs> because you might, as you can imagine, if there's a little bit of blood or anything here, uh, then it obscures your view. So the old scopes, you'd had to take it out, wash it, put it back in again, a few seconds later, drip of blood, and then take it out, and it was a, it was a real pain. Now you put this on, and this hooks up to an inter intravenous bag, and there's a foot pedal, and you press the foot pedal, and it clears the, uh, the end of the camera. So that, uh, that really has, uh, has transformed the way that we, uh, the way that we operate. So we talked a little bit about uh, the advantages of the endoscope and uh, again this is an endoscope just showing visually going in here and you can now see uh, much better than you could with a traditional uh, microscope. Um, and there has been a lot of uh, discussion uh, about you know is one really better than the other and I think most people agree now that the endoscope does offer significant advantages. There's an article uh, written in the uh, journal of Neurosurgery, which is one of our main neurosurgical journals, uh, saying that in 40% of cases, uh, additional tumor was visualized by the endoscope that was not appreciated with the microscope. And so again, it just provides more evidence of what uh, uh, those of us who do this kind of surgery have appreciated that the endoscope really helps in terms of visualization. So. This is how things are set up uh, in the operating room. Uh, scrub nurse, patient here, surgeon and assistant, and really it's two surgeons. Uh, uh, Dr. Masood would be standing here, I'd be standing here. Uh, anesthesia over here. Um, this is that image guided system that is used to tell us uh, the navigation system in terms of telling us where we are at any given time. And we used to bring in then the microscope and now that's really been replaced uh, by the endoscope. And this is what that looks like um, in the operating room. <coughs> here, you, so the patient would be here. We might just see the uh, chin of the patient uh, here. Uh, scrub nurse here, anesthesia over here. And uh, we are looking at monitors here which give us that uh, picture from the end of the uh, endoscope and uh, the screen here which is part of this uh, system which is the navigation system. What, uh, what have we done in terms of uh, transnodal surgeries? Well, it's interesting because the uh, endoscope has also had an influence on the the, uh, the, the type of surgery that we, that we do in terms of the numbers of surgery that we now do uh, via the nose. And what you can see here is that up until the early 2000s in Halifax, uh, we would do approximately 15 to 20 uh, surgeries through the nose a year. Uh, so that's, you know, one or two a month. And then in uh, 2007, we started to introduce the endoscope and for a while we used the microscope and then we would bring in the endoscope at the same time and, and, and use them both. And then as we gained confidence with the endoscope the following year, uh, we really implemented uh, endoscopic surgery. And in the last uh, uh, couple of years and again uh, this year, the number of, uh, of surgical cases that we're doing has increased significantly. And uh, that is because uh, we are using this technique not only for pituitary tumors, but also for other kinds of tumors uh, that are found uh, at the base of the skull. And, and whereas other, uh, before this time, patients would have had large surgical procedures with major scars, sometimes uh, uh, tissue uh, transfer flaps to try to close it. We're now able to do this uh, much uh, less invasively, if you like, from uh, using those natural uh, corridors through the transphenoidal route. And this just shows that in terms of the kinds of uh, tumors that we operate on, again, these are the same totals that you just saw in that previous graph. 
if we divide these tumors into non-functioning pituitary adenomas or functioning, so remember non-functioning means they're not producing hormones, functioning means they're producing hormones, you can see that the red and green here have stayed more or less uh, the same over time, maybe a few more in recent times, and I think part of that is that uh, uh, the referral from other provinces has increased uh, somewhat, and, uh, and, but the, one of the other big uh, differences is that what the other category really has uh, increased uh, significantly in the past uh, few years, and that's uh, that category that we just talked about. And I think that those changes, as we just saw, are quite uh, um, naturally linked to a change in, in technology in terms of what we're able to do. Uh, what if we look at uh, how does acromegaly fit into the picture of, uh, of the numbers of uh, surgeries that we do? You can see that you folks are a special group. This is not a, a high volume uh, uh, kind of... Uh, of um, a patient volume that we that we see, um, and it's on average maybe about five uh, cases a year. Um, and if you look at uh, population uh, base, uh, you know what is the how many new cases or new patients with acromegaly would you expect in a population? It's in the order of three or three to five per year. So if you think of our uh, population of, uh, of Nova Scotia and, and maybe including New Brunswick uh, PEI and parts of Newfoundland, then I think the numbers that we're seeing is, uh, is consistent uh, or are consistent with that.